and then they use the fully modified instrument. And then this is a, a related paper here with a shield 94 and this. And then this using univariate APSS stationary tests applied to Kenner is also by Mankowski and Kau. But these tests are all applied under the assumption that they are cross sectionally independent. And for obvious reasons, that's not. And then there are more recent developments right here. Uh, people are trying to deal with pictures, maybe introduce some high bearing structures here and there. And there are some surveys on this. But still, there are remaining issues there. And there are limitations. There. The more recent work improves some limitations, but still, they are not all uh, uh, fixed. So I think it's uh, useful to talk about what main issues were. Especially the independence assumption at earlier stage was a problem. And this is much more problematic and unrealistic in co integration context than union groups. This is because um, basically the limit process that it marks here, because we're talking about union groups, I mean the fitted literatures, the limit process will involve something like that. Right, this, it doesn't want to work. You see, from here. Something like this, it's not just Brownian motion, you actually look at the functionals of Brownian motion being like that, depending on if you look at fully modified ORS, you will be like this, and or the, the ORS type of literatures. And it involves, this is a Brownian motion, of, uh, limit Brownian motion related to independent variable, and X is related to independent variable, X, you know, Y and X is Y and X in our regression. So what uh, independence, Cross-sectional independence really requires a lot. That means y and x as a pair, they have to be independent of each other, not just now, but all in the past, all in the future. It is really also in too much. It is, it is much worse than the union. And even for simple lesson types, you will have to have independence across all time spans, which is really unrealistic. And then who's made it through? The earlier work, not only independence, but they have consumed independence. I mean, homogeneity, if you remember, homogeneity really values something. Like you can write things in double summation, and asymptotics was really easier to understand. So people make homogeneity assumption, but here, if you assume homogeneity like that, you end up assuming homogeneity. They have each cross section have exactly the same quintillary vectors, same error variance. Same number of regressors, and then same deterministic trend. If they have a linear trend, everybody else has to, and then the number of observations need to be also same. So the required homogeneity in this context is just more complicated. Because the, if you remember, I don't know if you would know uh, this coin integration test, the limit distribution depends on the dimension of x. That's why you really have to have the same number of regressors, everybody. So you're really asking too much. So here, and then, the, so well, if you want to allow heterogeneity in general form, then you really need much more sophisticated potential limit theorems and all large numbers. Some by now have been established, have been established but not, not all for all cases that are interesting. And also, here, especially in the context of co integration, formulating hypothesis is more crucial because if you want to say something is co integrated, you really want to directly say that they are all point related. But this is the same hypothesis A that we have looked at, which means everybody has this, every fitted literature from all four section union group means the, the panel is fully non point -tubular. And then they are testing against fully point -tubular. Every equation is point -tubular, which is not even proper, because alternative is not the negation of the norm. And the, but the hypothesis B, you are here. Nor is fully everybody, there's no point integration in all cross sections. So if you reject them, that means it doesn't say that everybody is co integrated, right? It's only some. So the, the indirect inference that you're getting is not everybody's co integrated. It's only the only some are co integrated, which is not what you want, right? So if you want to say that purchasing power parity holds, Everybody, all uh, all uh, real exchange rates should be stationary. So uh, 
And the only thing that we have hope for is this uh, the compartment you have. So now you have only some heavy universe, the mixed panel node, against the fully coined theory. So if you reject the norm in this case, then directly you're implying that everybody is coined theory. But again, this one, every statistic that people have looked at is just not in, it's not valid for this kind of test. So there is a problem too. So uh, you either set it down with um, overclaiming, right? By rejecting the norm, rejecting the norm, then nobody is going to break it. Taking that as a better evidence, which is really, you're compromising a lot. You either do that or something else. So uh, I think the pre more precisely formulating hypothesis issue becomes also more important in the coin integration context, simply because we are, what we are looking for is coin integration. So uh, again, this is really the order statistics is going to be only valid, especially the fourth, third one. And this is the same discussion that we had, so let me go. So uh, new co-integration test that I am going to propose here, and actually this paper is already published. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will still use a residual based test. Um, in two contexts, uh, we'll do B and C. So a uh, test not of fully non point degree against alternative of mixed panel where some are point degree or mixed I mean the composite norm where only some have been put against everybody's point degree. And I will use the nonlinear ID methodology, not surprisingly, and they will allow for general dependencies and heterogeneous various heterogeneities. So they won't be we won't be constraining our model to ask something that's unbelievable. How is this related to the for number of point regressions? Number of point regressions? We are not specifically testing what n is. I think you're asking whether we can test yeah. how many. It's going to be related to rank test. That's not that, that's not done here. It's not this paper doesn't cover that. We just say that there are some and there's we're some. not some, yeah. yeah, we're not making inference of that. So we have already seen this nonlinear ID panel residuals. That's quickly let me go through. Because we're going to be using nonlinear uh, panel residuals and they apply to this residual here. And there are different things happening here, so we'll have to modify them. But let me, but basically we're going to use nonlinear panel ID, right? So let me quickly review. So we had this model, right? So we're testing. So the difference. So this is a, my, we are testing whether or not VG2 has a universe. So we're looking at difference of this. And alpha i equal to zero means this guy has universe. If not, it is stationary, it's less than one, again. And then the, you can allow dynamics, the shoulder dynamics here like this, they are one structure. And then the innovation here, epsilon here, is a serially, I mean, the cross-sectionally dependent. So basically, I'm just using different location, but other than that, it's the same methodology. We'll make same assumptions like this before. And then this is a non augmented over regression like this. You have a lag dependent variable, lag differences of uh, residuals now. And then again, I, I'm going to be using here instrument generated function that satisfies the validity condition like this. This guy cannot be zero. And then uh, we're going to use uh, the integral transformation of 50, I mean, the lag residual. Uh, as an instrument, and uh, for differences, you use the variable themselves. It's the same as before. And then the t-statistics is defined as this. We know everything that appears as before, right? We know that this guy is building the eyes later. And the same as mathematics, mixed normal for the numerator, and then the local time as mathematics for integral transformation, remember, with the local time. So, and then we have, remember, the old functionality between the two, even when they are quite the correlating with, with each other, and then this is what's coming on top of your T ratio, and then that is mixed normal, so that individually T statistics becomes standard normal individual T statistics. Now we're testing whether or not which is your has been input, nonlinear ID on that, normal, and they are also asymptotically independent as well. Again, you're going to have, um, that's a strategy. Now, what I will do here, 
The problem here is that so far I pretended that I know you, but of course I don't. I have to use the difficulty comes from the fact so far if I knew to you, no problem. We just apply what we learned before. But problem is I don't. We have to estimate, right? So the difficulty, so now, now I'm going to have to use something like this. So let me introduce you. So we have to do more work because we are using not to residual. We are using things to residual. So I'm, let me explain the principle in the way we are saying so that things are clear. So I'm testing whether I know is equal to zero, but now you see hat and tilde. I'm going to use hat for the dependent variable. Everything is hat, right? Like differences using hat, but right? here I have a tilde. So what is the hat? This is always fitted, usual fitted residual. Okay, hat over here, where I use, of course, I don't know beta. So I'm going to use the estimated beta, but I'm going to, if you estimate entirely beta using entire sample, that's what people usually do. So I'm putting it as a usual fitted residual. And then, so that's going to be you have my usual fitted residual, and I will use that to, for the different, to construct the differences. But for the lag value, I'm going to be using u tilde, and then here I'm using beta tilde t, so it depends on the time. So how I'm going to get that? So for that, I'll be, instead of ORS estimator that depends on the entire sample, I'm going to be using adaptive ORS estimator, using only partial sample of the time t. Okay? That is related to our need to have marginal difference. Yeah. This is to this airport. Hmm? So this airport is T, what is the problem? Oh, starting from T, beginning of the time, oh, one. Right. Yeah. So one, two, T, two, and then you estimate beta T, and then the new T. Things like that, yeah. So, uh, but it, it's going to be still where it says maybe, but sample size will be changing depending on where you are. You use the sample of now to get beta head, and then once you have a beta head, you can get uh, beta tilde, right? And you can use tilde. And that is what's going to go up there, here. And then I'm going to use nonlinear instruments for that. And then what's inside is not going to have data anything beyond t minus 1. So it's going to be previsible. It's going to be previsible so that we have uh, the martingale property that we need for nonlinear semantics. So once you, the reason we have to use this for model fitting, see, when under the norm, this guy is equal to zero, right? You don't have under the norm, you, you, this is alpha equal to zero, right? That means you only have this, this the first one is nothing but AR model in delta ut. And then you can see that if you use a, a user fit to the ORS estimator, this doesn't depend on time. So you can always write it like this, right? Because it doesn't depend on time. It's independent of time. And this one as a vector, we can approximate it by infinite over AR. And then you can use order selection criteria like AIC and DIC so that you have, you can pick P and then you can have an AR model for delta UT. Right? But for this U tilde, if you use U tilde, it is really nice because it preserves the martingale property of absolute thing. Because this U tilde is going to be previsible at the time. If you condition on the information of the time now, it's already known. So it is essential. This marginal property is essential for nonlinear asymptotics. So uh, this one, again, I said that if you use it, the entire sample to get beta hat, it's independent of the time, and then the innovation for generating y and x, they can be easily approximated the AR order, AR model, uh, as shown earlier by Phillips and earlier. And this is well known result, and this paper is the basis of residual based uh, test for point integration. And then the, here you can see that why not just use tilde and just use one kind of adaptive fit residual? But if you do because of the time dependency, you cannot have the AR approximation. So you will have to rely on, therefore, this type of model. So you use HET, or as user fit residual for model fitting, and then the tilde adaptively, uh, adaptive fit residual for the testing, right? So uh, in the asymptotics, we need this. So it's an innovation for Y and innovation for X. Jointly, they convert to the Brownian motion and they are correlated. 
When you have this set correlated around emotions, you can always make it, you can represent them by independent brown emotions so that you have an identity covariant by using this well known canonical representation that makes our job easier. So well, basically, you see that, remember, this is adaptively visual, expressed this way, and then if you take the normalized them, and this is nothing but this, and then you can express that as a U tilde, which is nothing but some function of two independent brown emotion, W and uh, V. And indeed, uh, this W and V, you can write this U tilde linear process, you can write it this way, using C and V, C is defined as this, and once you have this, you can actually interestingly write u tilde as this one. So you have two parts. The first one is a, this is brown emotion, and this is a, the stochastic integral, which is a continuous martingale. DB, this is a, it is a, it does, it is a, it has unbounded quadratic variation. So this part is a continuous martingale. And the other part, you have a stochastic integral, but this one is uh, the bounded variation. So this whole thing, this integral is a process of bounded variation. So we started with the martingale, but now we have a semi-martingale. Semi-martingale is the sum of martingale and some bounded process. And then we have a nonlinear status for the exactly because we have everything going. And initially, we had uh, the local time status for martingale. But it is well known that we can also have it for semi martingale as well. So we we have, uh, even though we have to use the, the fitting procedure, where we have to use estimated data that changes over time, we can still have. So the whole exercise of this paper is that, yes, even if you use the fitting procedure to apply your kind of unit test, the mean theory, as in that normality and commonality of individual IDT statistics will hold, therefore you can do the same thing. Basically, that's the main message of this paper. Again, I show you in this paper that nonlinear transformation of adaptive fitting procedure is this the key variable, and they have the same SSI this normality with the, the same convergence rate, but now the local time is now different. This is going to be the, the local time of the new tilde, remember the new tilde process that we derived, which is turned out to be the continuous martingale, I mean the semi martingale, I'm sorry. And then everything else is, and the convergence rates are the same too. And then, therefore, the t statistics here will converge to normal, basically. Then the pattern, no different, you have the same thing. So you just apply that to each and every cross sections. Now, unbalanced pattern, fine. You just, here, I don't have one because I have a delta UT, so we're testing whether alpha equal to zero. So essentially, the same as what we have seen. And then the instruments, you have in, 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 integral transformation for adaptive fitting procedure for this guy, and then the other guys we just use the variable themselves, and then we get the individual normality, asymptotic independence between different uh, t statistics. So therefore, there you go. You can use either average or minimum statistics for testing second hypothesis, where you say everybody is not going to be versus some going to be or uh, you can use, uh, so again, you can use either average or minimum, that's totally valid, and as I said, uh, for the second uh, statistics where the alternative is a mixed pattern, minimum is more uh, powerful. For mixed patterns, the, the, plus, the, the compositor that we have seen in high pass, the last hypothesis, we can use maximum statistics, as I mentioned. So the both statistics average go to normal, standard normal, other ones. So this is indeed exactly the same as what we have seen. So the only difficult part here is to show that the adaptive mutated decision actually maintains the marginal property that we need. And in theory, actually, you can represent that the continuous semi marginal and then use the local time and other SMI theories for the local time SMI for semi marginal applies. And then the theory goes. Um, and then the simulations I have done. So here you basically have point to where you have a regression. And then axis is the I1 process. So you have I1 regressor. And U has a serial dependence in the AR1 form. But it also is correlated with X. So I'm allowing 
dependency chain, the integration of the innovation here and X, and, uh, and then there is also, you have a B here that's also serially dependent. But it's, uh, it's really giving you, so if the D is an innovation for X that is also serially dependent, you not only see it serially dependent, but it is also coordinated with the, the guy that generates X, and then the, the, uh, the innovation epsilon and the eta are correlated cross-sectionally. So this is a, a cross-correlation among the innovations that I was talking about. And if you go equal to one, that means the vibration error u has a universe, so there were no point vibration. If it's less than one, you have point vibration. And in our simulations, I'm going to look at the row very high, 0.95 or 0.90, and the various parameters that the Choice here, the AM coefficients here and there, and then also look at different sample sizes. So the small, the cross section is small to large, and T small to large, critical values. And then again, we generate the correlation here uh, generally, and then so that I can control how much dependencies I'm going. So if we really close to zero, you have really too much dependency, so that will become singular, it's one. And remember, R is nothing but the ratio of smallest dynamic values to the largest. So you can control the amount of dependencies that you're bringing in. And then for this simulation, I set it at about one to about ten percent. The simulation results. Yeah, I think I can use. Uh, Have individual tests, you have to normalize them. 
otherwise it's like uh, getting it's not like standardized you have to it's not zero cross thing and you have to take away the mean standardized by variable so that it is a proper element for sexual reproduction right so that is done one way or another different has choose to do differently but you have to do it at individual level but when you do it it's always there will be some approximation because you cannot you don't know mean and variance you have to come up with some kind of approximation right so that there will be approximation no matter how small they may be there will be but then if you want to apply central limit theorem what do you do use some is the nice ones normalized and standardized ones and then central limit theorem happens at n gets large so no matter how little approximation you have you're summing up and you have to sum up a lot otherwise the theory doesn't work right so you can immediately imagine that you are summing up approximation errors too so you will see remarkable in some cases the errors are stunning that's what i have realized when i was doing a lot of simulations i was the approximation error can be really large so who's tracking is an idea some specialists that if you want to stick to some test that involves this individual organization that may not be proper but then gives you good asymptotic theory then that's it and you can think about using bootstrap to improve financial properties but in any case uh, it's stunning in some cases and then some of you one of you had a question yeah for the test for the test for instance on the paper not on data. So in impersonation case, individual t is equal to the mean. Take away the mean, divide by standard error, that's the normalization. You have to have mean zero thing, right? That's the central limit theorem does. Use some many, many small nice guys. Central limit theorem say, if you have nobody that stands out too badly in right there, you will get nice numbers. So normalization is done in a network to make everybody nice and small, right? But that intention was good, but that you cannot do it perfectly. So you were, you cannot avoid having maybe some error, but then the requirement that you have to realize the number of standard error, you have to. So that's it. so the once they they first have to normalize, and then in the second stage you do normalized values using central limit theorem. At that stage, you have to have independence, right? Essentially, if you have a dependent system, you have to do more things. But often, up to now, people use independence. You either assume or you allow dependencies in a way you can take them away. Like, factor system was popular. Common factor uh, way of using common factor to allow dependency was popular because deep factoring was very natural. So if you defect, once you defect, what's left was under their assumption that if you separate one more, more independent. But I was arguing that not always it could be, but it's now a lot of people decide to buy that. Okay, dependencies are introduced through some common factors. So if you can somehow find out how many there are, effectively take them out, don't have to worry about it. You, you can pretend that you have to do That's what's been done actually. Okay, I can be one of them. But I can tell you in this paper what I'm saying is that the normalization, even before you get there, can be bad. And I'm, I'm going to show it to you, and then I'll use non-linear. I mean, not now. I'm going to come up with some new way of uh, uh, doing normalization. And actually, I'm trying to tell it again. I'm pretty lazy. I want to show you a way where you don't have to do further normalization. Okay? So basically, what I want to have is I have already normalized it one at one shot. So I don't need any further normalization. So that's a good thing, and for the remaining 30 minutes, I'll tell you what I did. I know it's late in the day, uh, so... So, people, what normalization, the normalization people have taken for the individual tests, there are two main types. The mean and mean variance standardization that we have seen in something like impasse or resistance test that I show you also, or p-value transformation, like model and group. But mostly, the mean, mean variance standardization are more common. So I'll stick to this first one. And then the cross-sectional dependencies, the another main issue, not in, I mean the pattern in the group is the dealing with the cross-sectional dependencies. I've used non-linear argument, which 
which I think is really effective. And a lot of people use or are willing to make some specific factor structures that allow them. Now, I think this one people we have done we have a lot of work on uh, including myself on this how to deal with cross-sectional dependence part. But I think not many people have paid attention to normalization issues. So I will focus this paper will focus on this normalization. So let me give you an example. In this relationship paper here, you have a heterogeneous panel. You're testing with R5 equal to zero for all I. So you will in Pesaranishin, they will get T statistics for testing R5 equal to one, and they take the average, and they so basically effectively what they're doing is they are finding the mean of individual tasks and the variance. Now, the mean and the variance depends on the way that they are simulated. They have to come up with this, and they simulate them by using independent IM numbers. So number one, and then that also assumes that you have, that's only valid when you have, it's as in time, when you have infinite large t. Number one, we don't have infinite large t, and a t, the finite sample, and we don't have IM numbers. So they are using two, but you have to start from somewhere. So if they use IID numbers, and then, and then they use values that are valid only when T is dependent. So there are two sources of approximate T. Sometimes it may be very well. It may do the job very well, and error is very, very tiny. Sometimes it may not. But in any case, it's there. But then we have to take the average. So you're summing up. And then that's their T bar set. And then, so under, so of course they assume independence. Right now, it's an ideal situation. You know that they are independent. But they are heterogeneous. But you don't know the mean and the variance. And then you know that ADFT statistics is not good, right? If you look at individual distribution, it's non, non, not symmetric. It's skewed to the wrong direction, right? <laughs> To the skew to the left, which is alternative, is not good for you. So when it's not symmetric, centering is terrible thing to do, right? Standardization forget it because they're so it's not easy. So they what they did there was using the but using the information, the limit, right? When t is large, and then again okay, then you know we have to simulate them, right? So anyway, that's what's happening. This is what's happening. Remember, this is independent case. This is not, we're not even realistic case of dependence. Independent. Now, when we, and then I'm, I'm looking at T sample size 25, the 50 and 30, and this is the, uh, and then I look at the cross-sectional dimension, 5, 15, 25, 50, and so that means you have approximation errors, and you are adding 5 times, 15 times, 25 times, right? So you can see that the larger the n is, the more opportunity for you to accumulate errors. So when n t is small, that means their approximation, which assumes t as a part of t, large t, it's bad, right? And when t is 100, it's not as bad. But when 25, t, t approximation, first is t approximation cannot be good. Look, so this is now their size, 1, 5, 10. So when any small, it's not terribly bad. 5% plus 16 bad, but not as bad as 57%. The size is 5% plus. It's a nominal case, so it should be 1, 5, 10. But now, we're in the independent case, but now we're off, and then you are accumulating this much. But as t gets large, their t approximation works better, but still, when n is 100, still 5% plus has 20, uh, the 12%. So if you have a reasonably, if you have a large t and reasonably small, here already, if you have a sample size t 100 and only 5 for n, not terribly bad, but it's bad. But if you have 200, it will be close to. So there, so anyway, but this is independent. So you can imagine when things are a little bit more difficult, it could be really, really bad. So what we're going to be doing, I mean, the, I, the reason we're going to get kind of terrible results is because they're trying to come up with modification when the situation is not good, when you're, uh, you're trying to compute mean and the variance of very non-standard distributions. And then, the, so the normalization is just very difficult, if not impossible, 
expression. And, and I said, um, you know, large T comes, but not always large T will solve the problem. And then the, the most tragic, tragic thing of all is that you have to sum them up to be able to. If you have to do NS time, essentially the theorem at the end, you have to sum them up, and that's the most unfortunate. So the new approach is going to be, we're going to be going through a new exercise to achieve a more efficient organization. So what this is based on my paper with the heart, uh, and uh, it's, a new, it's a new view of the universe. test. And then I'm going to, and then I use that approach in the kind of context. And this is what I'm about to show you. So let me first show you this new contour and asymptotics in the univariate case you an idea and then I'll show you how you may apply. So I'll first show you what I mean by contour, the new contour, and then the conventional contour is the, basically the test statistic when you're looking at computing from the same sample size. You can compute statistics from samples of same size. So you have, you're simulating, you're simulating many, many, many samples of the same sample size and compute the case statistically and then you build a problem you have, you know, many, many, many t statistics computed from many different samples of everybody's same sample size. That is that's usually what you have, and you can distribution of your t statistics when you do simulation. That's what we're doing with okay? that, That's the contour of equal sample size. But you can do different things when you do simulate. But why do you have to get samples of the same sample size? But you can fix sample variation, how much information is there. So you take only the samples with the same amount of variation. So you can look at sample sum of squares, for instance. So you look at, you draw many, many, many samples with the same sum of squares, and then compute t this from each sample and plot their distribution, just like you did before. And that is for the contour of each sample square sum. So you have an option to generate samples having all the same sample size and compute t statistics from each and every sample, right? And then you can get a different distribution of that. That's if sample size control. Or you get samples each having now the same sum of squares. Compute t statistics for your world, plot their sample and prepare the square. And then there, there is if squares of control. So I'll show you what that is. And then I'll demonstrate those and I'll show you what kind of data distribution you get, depending on what you have. So this is really too bad that you cannot see pictures. Really, can we make it any darker? <laughs> Let me pretend that I'm here. So can you see? Now, you can, everybody has a sample size here. Can you see it here? This is sample size up to 200 and this is in the middle is 100. So you have a sample path looking like this, or looking like that, or looking like this, or looking like that. So everybody has a different, everybody has the same sample size, but they have different amount of variation. They have different sum of squares. But on the other hand, you have a sample path going like this, going like that, going so uh, anyway, these are all, there are 10 sample paths, all ending in the middle. But they look different. Can you see, I think you see a little bit of something. <laughs> Do you see something? Everybody, uh, this is not even working. So, all the samples, they end by here. But they, if this one, for instance, it goes only like this, but this one goes like this. And then over here, this one doesn't vary very much. On top, it is very, very volatile. So it goes like this. So there are 10 sample paths. They all have the same sample size, but different sample skirt sum variations. But now, this is EP skirt sum contour. So now you have a sample path, 10 sample paths again. Here, but everybody, the common thing is they have the same sum of squares. The first one is most volatile, and it, it, it starts right here. The last one, it goes all the way until the end. Because it varies a little slope. It doesn't vary much. You have to go all the way until the 
again to achieve same level of variation. So I had just shown you 10 different separate how different they could be, but they all have one thing in common, same sum of squares. And sum of squares are usually taken as a amount of signal that you're getting from them. Right? So when you in the typical regression setting, you look at signal to noise ratio, signal is usually captured by sum of squares, right? Here, what we're saying is why do you look at the samples that contain same amount of information, not just same sample size? They might be more important here. And they get the key statistics and see how they go, and they are very different. Now, this is the distribution. So the, the one in the middle is a zero. If you look at, if you plot the key statistics computed from EP sample size contour, now this is a zero. This is not centered at zero, and they are skewed to the left. Remember, this is, I don't have any mean or trend, but you know that from your, your basic time series, the skewness more severe. Asymmetric skewness is even more severe if you introduce non-zero mean and trend, right? But now this is the best possible scenario where we don't have mean or I mean non-zero mean or trend. But still, you see, this is zeros right here. They are not centered and skewed. But here on the other end, is over EQ square sum contour. This is right at zero, and they are symmetric. And this is true even when your sample size is only 10. I, when I see this, I think I'm, it's too bad that you cannot see it, but you can see that this is zero. The pit is going to be even further to the left if you include the nature. So I think that you're going to be getting slightly different results depending on what you do. So I'll show you what kind of sometimes you have. I'm going to first show you the asymptotics for ORS statistics and what happens under the local alternatives. And I'll compare this with the new asymptotics for new contour. So I'm going to make a very simple new model, and you're testing with R5 to 1. And so let's say that there's no serial correlation for uh, simplicity for our arguments. So you have y input. So you, you don't have to worry about lack of kind of variables. T statistics simply. Uh, and, and alpha and minus one is standard error. So standard error is just so much right? And I'm just going to assume that we know the variance one so that you can get that out of the way. So simply, the awareness estimator is this. In the denominator, we have some squares, and this up there it is. And t states is under the norm. This is nothing but the DT plural distribution of this, right? And then we saw the picture of that before. And this DT plural distribution, when you don't have any constant, they look like this. Not centric, skewed to the left. On the other hand, if you have a, if you are looking at the new contour, basically, you are going to start with some fixed level of sum of squares, and then you are going to be looking at the sum of squares normalized by the uh, n square of the sample size. You, you will probably know why I need, I need 1 over n to represent some sum, to integral, and you need another n to normalize this y becomes i1 over the norm. You need this. So to normalize the sum of spheres, we're going to find the, the sample that I need to achieve this level of square sum normalized. And if you pick only those, then the asymptotics of those, if you use samples of size m now, right, the sample size that will give you for each immunization, you go until the size n, then you will get the normalized sum of square will be whatever fixed level that you start with. It. Then that key statistic will be known to you. This is exactly what we saw in the picture that I have shown. And actually, when we were writing this, I did a simulation for it because it's uh, intuition. And what's so striking, but so uh, contrary to my common sense. So uh, I wanted to see whether it is actually the case. So I read the simulation for this before, and it was really the case. And then we went ahead and proved the theory. And you can actually show you uh, that this is really the sketch of the proof. That under the the y, under the, when you have a unit root, if you normalize it, this is nothing but the, the partial sum process, normalized partial sum. And we know they convert this to Brownian motion in distribution. But you can always find distributionally equivalent copy of that that converges not just 
course, is distributed by an almost a sure sense of the Brownian motion. But that's well known in terms. So you can always find the partial sum that converges in almost surely uh, to uh, W, the standard Brownian motion. Okay? So that's uh, always possible to get called what's called a scroll embedding. And then I'm going to M is, I'm going to call it as a stopping time because I stop then, there, right? I go, I, I go M, once I reach the level C, I stop. That's why we call it stopping time. So I go until stopping time, divide by the sample size, and this is the thing that converges to Brownian motion square. So this is actually the way I define the C. So this is the square of the Brownian motion. Now, I'm going to the limit, I'm going to define Things instead of W N that converges to W out of W, and instead of uh, the uh, stopping time divided by I mean M N divided by N out of tau C, and then tau C is nothing but this guy M N divided by N. This is a proportion compared to the given sample size. How many observations you need to achieve that uh, level C? Then S times problem is very easy. You have this is O R S S better. Same thing, but you are sample moment is going, I mean, the, this sum is going up to n, not just n. Then you have this guy here and that, and they converge to almost surely to this, and this converges to this. This is nothing but um, the continuous Martinelle, and then the, this is going up to its stopping time. And indeed, what I will show you that this is a normal. I told DDS theorem, a okay, damage. <coughs> the this theorem that I mentioned to you earlier, that any continuous marking here is essentially wrong in motion. If you read not along the chronological time, but along the, the quadratic variation time, and then that is basically normal with the variance of C, and, that is, and then this one is nothing but C here. But that gives you our standard normal in theory. So basically, this is the proof. The, this is the limit of the key statistic, the almost sure limit of this. And then you can see that what you have here is the up, if you read up to this, uh, this uh, stopping time, this one, this guy is nothing but DDS Brownian motion of this continuous marking here. And that's why this continuous marking here, which is nothing but uh, the, the normal in the mean the variance is and you will normalize it by exactly why C is the minus one half that cancels the various part and you get the normal. So here, we are using the very well known DDS theorem, which basically says that any continuous marking here is like essentially from a But you just have to read it at the, its quadratic uh, variation time. And then the stopping time is really is what exactly is doing that. I go, you fix the quadratic variation, and you go until you hit that level, and then you stop it. Okay, that's going to that's what's happening here. And then lower S is uh, when what's happening when alpha is uh, really close to one. Are we going to have non-trivial power? Right? Sometimes some tests don't have a lower power. If the null and alternatives are too close, it's very hard to tell, right? It's hard to have a non-trivial discriminatory power if the null and alternative is too close. And that's exactly how how close is really if n is really big, then the alpha, the alternative null is one, right? You need the norm. But n is very big, the alternative is very close to the norm. It's very hard to tell whether it's null is true or not. But we want to have a consistent test so that it has some power, even when the norm and the alternatives are very close. So we're looking at that. So under when alpha takes this form, you can show that this actually converges to this. And this is called the locality parameter. And then you have, in the second term, you can easily show that this is normal. And then the first term is nothing but delta locality parameter, and then the level of C that we set. So you will have non-trivial power, even when the normal and alternative are very close. And then this is the proof. Um, and then the, so uh, I can extend it this to uh, non-linear case. And then we can also include, include, we just look at ORS, but we can include nonlinear IV with general uh, instrument generated function, not just include, but we can get the homogeneous functions and other things. 
And then we can also obviously introduce dependencies. So uh, if you remember nonlinearity, so we're going to apply, we estimate ID estimator of alpha, and f is the instrument generating function. It doesn't have to be integral in this case, right? Because we're looking at independent case. We're going to say whether you took care of it already. I would just assume that we took care of the dependence, so we have independent case. So anything can be, as long as it satisfies certain mathematical conditions. So again, same definition, IB estimator, you have the instrument and dependent variable, instrument and independent variable, you have it. And then the IB statistics. So now I'm going to use the asymptotically homogeneous functions, which can be, if you have a polynomial, that's homogeneous already. But you can have a CDF type of functions, logistic functions, things like that, that's also um, asymptotically homogeneous functions. But asymptotically homogeneous functions also include law. It is really general class. And you can always write it as a, this way. So you have a limit homogeneous function and the asymptotic overlap class. And then the, along the conventional contour, it converts into this. But if you have a linear function, the h is going to be identical function. It will be exactly the same as what you have seen earlier, the linear case, right? Or as a But in ID case, you can have general linear functions, h. But generally, this guy is not normal. Unless these guys are orthogonal, but we know that these are not in the linear case. So generally, you have non normal. Although it may look strange, just imagine the linear function, identity function is certainly homogeneous function, but it falls into, in that case, you just have identity function. And this is exactly the, the typical distribution, right? And then, but along the new contour, but now, M, you will go until, and you, number of observations you need is M, and M is nothing but, what? The normalized, now, instrument sphere, right? Not so much sphere, but instrument sphere. But normalization, you have to take it, this uh, new is asymptotic order. You need one over M, so that you can change the summation to integral. But to normalize this instrument generating function, you need sphere of the asymptotic order. Other than this, everything is same. Because now, again, if you use non-linear ID, not the sum of spheres of the y, but f of y. You will take sum of spheres of f of y. That's why you need not n sphere, but n times sphere of this one. Okay? And then, uh, if, if you do that, then the t statistics sort of the new control will be the standard. Okay? And then the local alternatives, you can do that, and I can show you that actually this uh, can be expressed as a locally parameter time this stochastic process plus something else. And I can show you that the second guy will be normal, and this will converge to some stochastic process like this that involves the C. So uh, this is going to also have non trivial problems. But before I go, I'd like to introduce something very interesting, which is Cauchy. This is nonlinear ID, T statistics, but your nonlinear ID instrument generated function is in particular sum. It only takes sign of you, nothing else. So that's your so the if you take the nonlinear ID, the push the sign function is an instrument generated function, denominator and the numerator and denominator look like this. Now because sine takes either 0 or 1, right? Sine sphere is always 1, right? So you have this, and then, so you get this expression, and then, but that's what you have in the normal equisample size contour. So therefore, if you rewrite it, the limit of this guy can be expressed as this, and which is well known to be semi-normal. Here, these two guys are. This, this integral is well known to have a normal volume. W is a standard volume. If you have a sign, a lot is known to have a standard volume, which this is more of the same. This has standard normal distribution. So here, in this case, uh, it's very interesting case where two different equals S and is coincide. Whether you take the equal square sum or the equal size, you will have standard normal. So Cauchy is very interesting exception. So if you have an intercept, you can take care of it. You just have to use a t-mean variable. Okay, and then you, instead of regular, 
you can put limit y, left and right, and everything works exactly the same. So when the limiting, you can use initial value or the adaptive limit. Whenever you do nonlinear estimating, using adaptive limiting is essential because we do need more to get property. But other than and then, but if you use a limit, think that the Brownian limit will be given not by the limit Brownian function, not regular, but uh, as you expected. And then uh, you can uh, you can see that even in this case, you will see the whole new contour. You can get the normal asymptotics. And the serially dependent case, you can easily allow. So here, you just have to get the uh, not y, but you, you first have to purge it away back from the serial dependence like this, and then and then you take the square sum of this uh, you know process that is free from the serial dependence, and then again along the new before you get normalized parties, and then you can apply that new pattern. So what you have to do is for each and every pattern, you will have to find the size m for which remember that c is going to be same for all cross sections. So therefore, but you have a different variation for different cross sections, so the M will be different depending on which cross section you have. But still, you have to achieve the same level C. That will give you some problem. But anyway, it's important that you have one C, and everybody has to achieve that level. But I'm calling that M sub I, that's the number of operation you need for I cross section to reach the sum of square to reach that level. If we do that individually, we know they goes to normal zero, obviously, and then these are going to be independent of each other. Okay, but M, but I am assuming that you have enough observations available to get M I and M J. But if the other, if you do that, then you can look at the average statistic just like before, then you will have standard one, just like before. But then you have a, the, we have not any modification or just we didn't do mean and variance modification or p value or whatever, but we achieved that already. We didn't do the second stage in you know, NS instance. But problem is, in reality, we don't have any number of operations, right? If we have a very, very large number of operations, then we can fix some C, then everybody can achieve whatever C. Go and give you this C, right? Some of spheres. But if you have a not so big sample size, then some cross section you may achieve the level right here, but some may not, right? Then this thing can, this unit cannot achieve the required level. So this is happening right here. So uh, this this guy has a sum of squares this much. This guy doesn't have very much variation. So you have only this big sum of squares, right? This is all the sum of squares. But for our new control parties, everybody has to have the same amount of variation. So if I, my, if I want to match the, this guy, then this guy has to go further on to be able to match this, right? In reality, here what we do is uh, we'll, we'll change this sample from what's available by Bootstrap. We will sample until we achieve that. So in this case, Bootstrap becomes very useful. So this is a right part, and this is an extended sample by the user. But if you have a Cauchy, Cauchy was a very interesting case where two control kind of met each other, concurrent. And this is interesting. Cauchy, some of the is the same, right? So sine square is one for everybody, so everybody is n. So they match, so no need for sample adjustment. So this is another thing why Cauchy is me. And actually, because of that, I mean, if you have to do this, the booster is good, but it's still it's not original. So there is could be a problem, and actually that shows in our simulation. It, it has a, we have it could, this extension can cause more size restrictions and lose power. But push is kind of nice. So how? But if I don't have, if I want to use regular mode, then I still have to match the sample. So what I do is, uh, if you are beyond the number. N, right? If you have to go further than the given sample size, and from n plus one, you will be using, you will, you will be starting from the last sample, but you will be adding. So this is a resampled, centered, right? You pick a model and get the residuals, and then you center them, and then you just add them. You're going to be resampling from the center with the errors, 
and then you go answer. So you're going to be in terms of why you will use why if you're less than the original sample size you use. But if you are not, then you will have to pick y t star, and then y t star in will be sampled by bootstrap, and then because we need to extend the sample. So what we have is uh, this guy, it have still converted to normal, so the normal distribution is the same. And whether or not you have to extend it by bootstrap or not, you still go to normal, but local to, the local alternative hypothesis asymptotic is different. Now, here it will convert it to this. And then the C, originally we had C, but now I have C plus, and C plus is given like this. Because I cannot go more than T, whatever it is. If it's uh, happening, the stopping time is before the end of the sample is fine, but if it's after, I still have to pick one, because I cannot go beyond one. So that really compromises, and that thing that is applied that determines how far away you are from the, the norm, the normal, is compromised. It's less than what it's going to be. So, uh, so the problem is there's a uh, doing this uh, in terms of local value, there are two things. We, by doing new contour, there's a positive effect because we still have normal estimates. But the problem is if you because we have to reach the new contour by bootstrap, uh, we are losing some local. So uh, this is a comparison between two local power, two tests, when you have an uh, infinitely large sample so that you reach the control without having to rely on bootstrap, then obviously that is better than the one that we have to bootstrap. But if we compare with the ORS, right, and then the feasible new control test, it's not obvious. If you look at one first part, ORS is better, because or, but if you look at the second part, our test is a standard normal, so we don't have uh, asymmetry or skewness is better. So it really depends on whether it's uh, our new contour with the bootstrap extension uh, is better or then whereas the conventional contour thing will be really depending on the climate climate, how far away you are uh, from the climate. So this is really illustrates. If you are really, when the locality parameter is really large, then it's your further away from the north, then ORS is the best. But, so the, this guy is the ORS. But until, but when it's not that big, our, our new control test does better. Uh, especially the one with the large sample, so that we don't have to do full strap as well. But when you the feasible one, is this one. Especially when you're close to this, it is doing much better than the others. Although it doesn't do as good as the ideal in each of the case cases. So, uh, and then the simulation shows, uh, actually I'm comparing the impasser and shift test, which has terrible normalization record that we show all the distortions. And then the, the CP is my test, and then the Cauchy test. And then as you can see, this is sizes, so the impasser and shin, really bad push. Our test said pushing, they're pretty good. Impasser and shin just gets really bad, really bad, and even worse, right? But our test, pretty good size. But in terms of power, this is size of the steel power. Push does less. But this is the case when you have uh, it's an independent case. I mean, you can see that push, because we don't have to reach the control by push that they do that. I mean, the, there are different things for the, 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 the independent case. Uh, here you have a larger sample size. But beforehand, we only have a very small sample size. But when you have a larger uh, team, the things are, and the impressor engine size distribution gets smaller, but 5% is still 12%, but their power is still lower than our test. And Koshi is still does that. Independent, dependent case, then instead of uh, impasseration, because that uh, assumes independence, I use the Phillips and Sir test, which allow for dependencies, and then uh, we apply. The Phillips and Sir test, the size is good, but their power is hopeless. It's even when their test is not different from their size, but our test does very push, 
goes stably very well. The sample size gets large. The size is still good, but the power uh, it is uh, still it has a Felix sensor here test is not so the, there are still more work to do, but uh, I think uh, this really gives a nice way of normalizing. And uh, I will just uh, conclude uh, my talk that way, uh, although kind of related to cooperation. Um, I use the non-linear ID uh, in different ways. I think the asymptotic normality and the automatic that we achieve, so the essential we have incredibly useful and especially because we didn't have to do this implementation uh, to talk about the problem. But yet in this paper I show you potential to improve open implementations. Uh, I think the, I didn't do any further work from here on because my research is switching to the areas that I'm going to present in tomorrow. Uh, but I think uh, this non-linear ID methodology is really a lot of potential. So uh, thank you so much and if you have any
can have a, you can have a smaller C. Because even with a smaller C, you will have enough observations, then there's less chance that you have to go further than what you have, right? But when you have already small sample, right? Then you cannot be too small. So, and it, it actually it may not be that too bad, because if you have only 20, it makes sense to resample from what you have and extend. So, I would recommend for practical implementation, but this is nothing to do with theory. Theory, as long as it's a big one, people want for smaller sample size, and then the smaller one for larger. Thank you. 